was going to say good morning, good day, gentlemen. We're back to City Scope. We're you know out of the out of the closet. Go with that, and back. And we got two great guests here. And I don't know how we're going to do this today. We've got <laughs> Mark and Mark, Mark Lafave, Mark Bedanza, two authors, two local authors. The books we're going to be talking about today are sports related. Fitting in Lemonster, one about baseball and one about football. A couple of different like angles on them, but guys, it's great to see you. Especially you, I haven't seen you in years. Great to be here, Jack. Yeah. It's great to yeah. see Mark again. Yeah. yeah, nice to see you both. And uh, yeah, we got a couple of our local sports books. Yeah, um, which, as Jack knows, at least I've been. Fooling around with since back in 2009 when I released my first book. You know, I, I never ever asked you, but like, you know, we, we know you as a lawyer. First right. of all, we know you as a, a, a great football player from like 1973, <laughs> but, but we know you as a lawyer. Are you uh, an author masquerading as a lawyer? Or how did you get <laughs> in? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a how fun did you get it, into it. it. it well, Accidentally, yeah. uh, and I don't know how Mark's journey was, and I'd like to hear that because I'm interested in other writers and how they get involved. I, I wrote my first book only to have a compendium of information on what I discovered. I wanted it to be preserved. Yeah. It started off as a program for that reenactment football game that you guys got involved in and filmed uh, back in 2009. Football was way different back then, and I wanted people to understand what they were watching. And I wanted to preserve all this material that I found from a variety of places about early football history in Leominster and Fitchburg. So I said, too much for a program. I'm going to write a book. It'll sell 100 copies to my family and friends. Big deal. But more importantly, there'll be a copy in the Historical Society. There'll be a copy in the library. Somebody wants to pick this up 20 years from now, 80 years from now, they can run with it. It sold, I think, 3,000 copies at the local Barnes & Noble store within like six months. And I said, how'd this happen? And um, people started calling me an author. And I said, wait, you got some, you're mistaken. I'm not an author. I'm just a guy that put a book together. And that's what happened. Yeah. The rest is history, as they say. And now we've got Mark Lefebvre, and I didn't introduce you to begin with. I have to apologize. It's okay, Jack. Now, is this your, this your first book? Yes, it is my first, first book. book. And what he said... Basically, I wanted to uh, take this information that I knew was out there and preserve it, have my family and friends buy a few copies, and uh, as, uh, as Mark said, have it on the shelf at the library, yep. have it at the shelf at the high school library, and have it on the shelf at the historical society. And there's a big difference between the two of these. One, you had to research it going back in history, and you basically lived this. I lived it, but there was a lot of research, yeah. and it was available, and um, as I was telling Mark earlier, uh, in the book, there's, um, you know, the three teams that I focused on, which are the 1971, 72, and 73 All-Stars. Out of those three teams, there are 34 surviving players, and I interviewed uh, 28 of them. Now, this is Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth League. Yes, Babe Ruth to, Baseball. To clarify it yep. for, the, for the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's talk a little bit about where your journey in baseball started. It's kind of It kind of goes back to neighborhood things right where we're sitting pretty much yeah the neighborhood thing and it's amazing because uh it was unsupervised by adults and if it was almost like appointment at eight o'clock on a saturday morning you knew there were going to be 15 kids 20 kids at the cemetery at st louis leo cemetery ready to play ball high ball mm -hmm. and we had bases we had them marked off we had rules we negotiated the the the, the ground rules we picked our teams and we settled our scores and our dis differences right there without the help of, of parents. And then we had a very, very uh, prolific Little League uh, environment in Lemonster. We, at the time, had three leagues, North American, uh, I'm sorry, North Lemonster League, the National League, and the American League, both minors and major teams. We had in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 kids playing Little League baseball yep. in any summer. So we went from playground to Little League, which was a great feeder system for Babe Ruth. Now, when you started in Little League, where did you play first? I played over at the American League over on 12th Street. Okay, so you got into the new fields? Within the new fields? Well, with the, they had the two fields yep. with the nice fences. Yes, no they, lights yet, but right. yes. We started Saxon Trade. I don't know if oh, you remember. Okay. Yeah, Jay Burke told me about that. It was that. pretty much... Yeah. Uh, it was gravel. Yep. 
you slid in, you'd, you'd ruin your knees. Mm -hmm. And that was my first year, nine years old. The next year, we went to 12th Street. Yeah. Because they, they built a, the new fields. And they had a major and a minor. Mm -hmm. Minor league, rancher minors. Yep. First time up, I, I hit a home run over the fence. Nice. This is easy, you said, and, right? Yeah. That's when I, <laughs> when I could hit the ball. But I got, I got, I got to make these shows about myself because you guys, are, you know, you're big shots with the <laughs> books. So all here, I do is sit here and talk. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> but my cousin Nano DeCarolis, who was a really good baseball player in high school years ago, he says you're the first one to hit a home run in these new fields. Nice. He says, and I was the first one to hit one at Doyle Field. He was a lefty yeah. over the clubhouse. Yeah. So he says we got something in common. Who's the first guy that caught a pass on a Monday Night Football? First guy that caught a pass on my... Oh, I'd say first oh, that's a tough one. Milt Moore. Was it really? Just right. a wild, yeah. wild guess. Right. We had him because, in Just because years. of what you write about. <laughs> but anyway, 12th Street Fields were mm -hmm. a great, you know, a great asset to the city. And we had uh, we had one on uh, North Lemister, North. I think it was on Bernie Sav. Bernie Sav, and yeah. then the North Lemister, and the then the North, Northwest School. And the yeah. Babe Ruth League incorporated players Correct. from all those feeders. Correct, they had a drive. Yeah. We're going to jump ship here, and we're going to go to Mark. Mm -hmm. Mark, this book is uh, about pretty much a legend in Lemister. Someone who, you know, a lot of people have heard about him, but they don't know the whole story. The only story that, you know, I was ever really familiar with was when they won the Rose Bowl, and he said, I want to say hello to everyone back in Lemister, and I guess the town went crazy. Yeah, which, which at the time was like winning the Super Bowl mm -hmm. because college football was preeminent. You know, the NFL had just, in 1933, for the first time, had a formal championship game. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, they would just, whoever was on the top of the standings would be the champion, unless the two teams at the top were tied, then sometimes they would have a special runoff. But other than that, they had no championship game. Mm. So the Rose Bowl was the only college football bowl game through 1934. So winning it, like I said, was like winning the Super Bowl. I was thinking of when you were talking to Mark about his book, that, you know, there's a saying, it's election day today, all, all politics are local. Well, all sports are local mm -hmm. too, really. I mean, a lot of us identify, you know, with a, net, with a team, a professional team, but we also identify with our local sports. And it, it's really sort of what gets us interested in sports as a as youth, mm -hmm. is following some of those kids that played at the high school and they were our idols. This guy came up in my research a few times in my first two books, um, the second book being 1933, Football, Depth of the Great Depression, um, which I'm very proud to say that Bill Belichick actually read and sent me a letter about. Um, 1933 is, has a greater amount about Lou Little in it than, than my first book. But I was sort of surprised to learn that this guy didn't have a biography. And he's an icon at Columbia. He's an icon at Georgetown. He was a legendary college football coach. You mentioned one of the things he's famous for, one of the greatest upsets in college football history, that Rose Bowl game in 1934. He also helped end a 21-game winning streak by Army, which was a huge upset, 1947. But there's so much more. I mean, he sat on the Heisman Trophy Committee um, in 1935, helped develop the Heisman Trophy. Um, he was the rules chairman in college football for a long time, it helped shape the game uh, with different rules and improvements. And he was the lead defender of college football against charges of over-commercialization, or which, what they called overemphasis of football on college campuses. He, he was a bulwark against those, uh, those charges. Um, but more than anything, this guy was not only a successful college coach, but he was a humanitarian. Mm -hmm. And he took... Um, he took the players' lives seriously, mm. not just on the field, but what they would accomplish in life through academics and careers. He would once uh, chided a reporter who, when he asked the reporter about a former player, and the, the reporter looked at him quizzically and said, what do you care? He's not in your program anymore. He says, if that's how I thought, I wouldn't have very good football teams. And that's the kind of guy he was. One of my favorite stories about him was he, it was a kid that was playing, and um, he got to know every one of his players well. And he said to him, he knew he was coming from a single family. 
He says, does your mother get to the games? And he said, no, coach. My mother's a waitress downtown in Manhattan, and she has to work the lunch cart on Saturdays. About a week later, his mother had a, a, a promotion at her job, and she wasn't working Saturdays anymore. Really? <laughs> and he just did, took it upon himself to do that. So just I'm proud to have a Lemister guy, Lemister native, not born in Lemister, Wiki and all of the colleges, those big academic bastions, had him being born in uh, Lemister in 1893, and his Italian name is being Piccolo. Through my research, I discovered that he was born in Boston in 1891, not 1893, and his Italian name was Pisciarelli, not Piccolo. Mm -hmm. So I just sent, I just corrected Wikipedia and sent letters to the universities. <laughs> But uh, it just it was a pleasure. And like Mark, I mean, this stuff is here, you know? Yeah. And, and it's like when you know, um, I'm secondhand, but when you know, I know some of the people that know him, yeah. it's just so much more rewarding. Now, I've heard about him, but in 1983, when we filmed The Rivalry, they had a, a dedication of sorts for Lou Little at the Historical Society. Right. And there were four people they brought in that played for him on that Rose Bowl team. Right. And when we talked to them, I'd say 90% of the story that they told wasn't about playing football. Mm. It was about him being a champion for their education, how he would you know, fight tooth and nail to get them into a program. And then, like you said, follow them. Yeah. Let's go back to you because, you know, <laughs> this is going to be tough with the two of you. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I'm learning a lot as we go along as well. All right. How did you first, you know, neighborhood, you get involved with mm -hmm. baseball, mm -hmm. and then when did the idea come that I want to preserve these great memories that, you know, I think it's really kind of a cool thing that if a kid today reads this stuff, you know, they heard stories about, oh, yeah, they used to tape up the baseball and play with a black tape baseball. They used to put nails in the bat and then, you know, yep. put the black tape around it. And now they can read it and, and get to know some of the kids, mm -hmm. well, men now, old men now, from <laughs> Lemonster who actually lived through this. So sure. want to take us through the story of this? Yeah, so I have to be completely candid. This is what got me to write the book. Okay. Mr. Bonanza's book on the history of Lemonster because um, being away from Lemonster for quite some time in terms of where I live, I always remain connected because of my family and, and so forth. But this gave me a sense of pride oh, uh, for the community you. that, um, you know, there are, to your point, there are so many stories that are out there and there's so much information. That said, um, we, are, we are approaching the 50th anniversary of the 1971 Babe Ruth team winning the, first, uh, winning the state championship in 1971. When I got the idea a couple of years ago, first person I talked to other than my wife was Mr. Bonanza. I called you on an April Mark's Saturday right. morning. <laughs> <Mark>. <laughs> called, him, called him on an April. Uh, it was just before Easter and I pitched this idea and, um, you know, he kind of poked around a little bit. And the more he poked me on it, the more I thought we had a compelling story. So for the record, the 1971, 72, and 1973 Babe Ruth teams became the first organization, the first city to have three consecutive Massachusetts state championships for Babe Ruth baseball in the history of Babe Ruth baseball in Massachusetts. It's only been one, done once since, and that was again done by Lemons during the 90s, believe it or not. So wow. 71, 72, 73, 50th anniversary of those three teams, I thought it'd be timely. And for yep. the same reasons, to get this information out and published so that people in the future can have a record. Now, what do you think contributed to the fact that there were three years in a row of like getting together great ball players, great coaches, to be able to accomplish. And that's happens. really the underlying yeah. theme of the book, Jack, is the sense of community, yeah. where we had an opportunity to um, develop our skills early on in life without adult supervision. There was a league, uh, there was a league you could play locally in any one of three places in Lemons, the Little League. We had hundreds of volunteers, that not only the coaches, um, but we had the guys that took care of the field. We had the ladies and the guys that took care of the concessions. The newspapers covered them. We had my Little League All-Star team in 1970 went to the state tournament. WLMS mm. covered that game live. Yeah. When we won the states in uh, Longmeadow, 
WEIM and WLMS, were they alive? And then, you know, guys like, um, uh, the, you know, the writers, Chip Donahue, um, uh, Ken Albridge, yep. and folks like that, they went to the game, they took pictures, they wrote the articles and so forth. So there was this ecosystem of baseball that fed the Babe Ruth system. And you know who the biggest beneficiary out of all this was? Emil Johnson. Yeah as the high school and Legion baseball coach, because all of these great players now who had six, seven, eight years of competitive baseball were now available to play high school baseball. Yeah, Emo, he's an, another legend. Yeah. 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 Mark's book really does, I was impressed with the sense of community you get out of reading it. I mean, it, it tells you how people succeed in sport. I mean, you, you know, it's like actually Lou Little is kind of famous for saying that, you know, a, a coach can have his team ready in technical aspects every single way but at the end of the day it's the psyche you know and that psyche that led to the success of those teams I'm sure was largely and it conveys in Mark's pages that there was that sense of community that they played for each other mm. and they st a lot of these guys are still close right yes they are they yeah. golf together yeah yeah it's really an endearing it's an endearing book yeah I you know I, I got a chance to to skim through it, and you know, I did recognize a lot of names. And did you recognize your name? Yeah, I spotted it with, next to Greg Kachidis. So yeah. that, that was a that was a team right there. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, and again, getting back to those days, developing players in baseball. If you didn't have five, six, seven people, did you ever play with like you draw a square on the wall? You'd get a tennis ball, and you'd have one guy up at bat and one guy pitching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they hit the ball a certain spot, it was a single double. Sure. And you could actually have a game with just two people. Yep. <laughs> and Greg and I used to do that all the time. We used to go up to Fallbrook School. Yeah, right across the street yeah. at Joe and Tony Shirelli's house. Yeah. We used to yeah. play in his backyard. To your point, we had a, on the door of the shed, it was taped. Yep. And um, I was a left-handed batter, and it was... Uh, a swamp off to the right, so if I hit a ball over there, it was an automatic three outs because nobody wanted to get the ball. So I learned how to hit to the opposite field, yeah. wow. which is what got me to play in high school. Shirelli, you mentioned the name Shirelli. Now, there's a name that you know is synonymous with baseball in Lemonster. Um, I can't remember his father's Gidio. name. Gidio. Okay. Gidio. Yeah. They He's mentioned an umpire and a coach. Yeah. He used yeah. to fill in for Emil Johnson coaching American Legion games. And I can remember Deco Pignata being an umpire, oh, too. Oh, yeah. With the cigar <laughs> behind the <laughs> yeah. Steve Reich, you remember that? Oh, he, yeah. used to, he was great. Classic. Yeah. All right. Can you relate anything between, um, you know, the two things that you've done? Uh, you mentioned community. Mm -hmm. Both of them talk about community. Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, community is important. Yeah, to both I mean, I think, as I said, you know, the sporting experience on with everybody on to some degree is local, and we, you know, we we don't just wake up being fans of the Patriots or the Celtics or whatever. We we have a experience locally, and I think that's you know a lot of what Mark's book's about. My book as well. Mm. I mean, you know, Lou Little played his high school football here in Lamester. And um, which was interesting. And he, then he came back after a year of prep school and coached at Lamester High uh, for one mm. season, which was fascinating. Um, successfully, too. Mm. Um, so, and what a family. I mean, one of his brothers was the Little and Anderson Little suits. And another brother was a war hero that fought for Australia and France before the United States was in World War I and then laid out for the United States. And was was wounded seriously twice in um, in fighting for all of those three countries, so it, quite a family. Yeah. But you know, th th this stuff gets buried, and even like Mark said, like th his book is more recent history. But you know, time flies, and 50 years hence from now, that book will be kicking around someplace, and somebody can pick it up and read about these ancient players that played a century before. To me, when I write something. You know, it's a great feeling knowing that someday, you know, it's not going to be a, hundreds of people, but somebody will pick that up, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll enjoy it, and they'll learn about something, and and those people are honored, really, you know, forward into history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And once once you have a sense of doing that, and you sense the value of that, then you see the continuum of life makes more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, being born, dying. You know, each generation having the same struggles, really. I mean, mm. things change, but things don't really change. 
Um, so I think that that's all part of it. Now, Mark, you lived this, yes. right? But you did also do the research. Yes. So when you were going back to research, say, these teams, the games, um, and some of the memories were rekindled, yeah. okay, how did that affect you? Did it, like, did the fire just grow and grow and grow and... Yeah, uh, to be honest, Jack, um, writing this book was very emotional. Um, we've lost some of the players, um, but um, my mom saved all my scrapbooks, and most of the other players, their moms and their dads saved their scrapbooks, so the players were very generous in sending me and meeting with me, allowing me to interview them, um, but I used information that dozens of players had sent me. And so the, the research was, yes, I had to go back and kind of research what it was like to be in the community and, and kind of align that with my own recollections and so forth and apply it in a way that's kind of consumable, just not, you know, dry facts that mm -hmm. Lemister was boom, boom, boom. So that said, yes, I had a, a very emotional attachment to writing this book because it brought me back to living upstairs at my grandmother's house up the hill here right outside on Elm Hill Avenue growing up, up at, off of Union Street with you and the other gang up there and what that was like and eventually going to high school and venerating guys like Mark and his class who were two years ahead of me. I mean, you know, the guys that played football ahead of me. You mentioned George Wallace yeah. in the hallway. Um, you know, he was a fullback. I had his yeah. number. He came into the locker room at the high school and says, I want that jersey when the season's <laughs> over. And, you know, that kind of, those kind of shenanigans took yeah. place, but it was, it was very emotional for me to... Now, speaking of George Wallace, I'm helping Mark out here with the Football <laughs> Hall of Fame, and I'm researching some of... Um, actually, I'm pulling clips for some of the guys who got inducted, and I was working on Eric Ledger, and I can't remember the year. might have been 71, which would have been George Wallace's sophomore year. year, right? Right. That's right. And I'm trying to find clips of Eric Ledger, who was a running back and a uh, defensive end, and all of a sudden I see number 35 go crashing through the line. I see number 35 going crashing <laughs> through the line, carrying four people on his back. I see number 35, this fire plug of a guy who yep. was short and big, yep. outrunning guys that looked like sprinters. And it's, that's George Wallace. And then came Steve Ringer doing the yeah, same thing. Same thing. Unbelievable. <laughs> and again, in yeah. the Sandlots, yeah. George Wallace, again, right around here. He grew up on, what was it? Uh, uh, Dudley. Yeah, Dudley. Yeah, right up Dudley, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when we inducted uh, Bobby Nativia to the Hall of Fame a number of years ago, Doug Cormier, who grew up on Chestnut Street, yeah. um, they had... Up near Barrett's, they had a whole field built and everything. They had an intercity league run by, like like you, mm -hmm. run by the kids. Mm. And his secret weapon was, as he called them, Met, Bob you know, yeah. Nativia. And so he, he, he started as a Sandlot player, too. And the name of uh, the Chestnut Street Chargers. They yeah. had a neighborhood team there. Yeah. They had one. Uh, French Hill was always, like, the, the best team because they had this guy, they called him Midnight. I don't know who he was, but... He was like the coach. Mm -hmm. We used to play at the, you know, I didn't play for them. I played for Chestnut Street Chargers. Again, no adult supervision, mm -hmm. yeah. 11 on 11. Mm -hmm. you'd, whatever helmet you had, mm -hmm. if the color was red, you'd get a red T-shirt and put tape on it for a number. Played at the corner of uh, uh, Manchester, not Manchester, yeah, Mechanic Street and Johnson Street where there's some condos there. Oh, yeah. That was one of the fields, too. Unbelievable what everyone learned back in those days with no adult supervision, how to work out problems without someone having a rule book. And you found a to, way to get there. Right. You, I you, mean, stingray bicycles without yeah. gloves over the handlebars. Yeah, yeah. And if it came to a fight, the fight would take place, the, sh the hands would be sh shaken you afterwards. Get back on the field. You get back on the field and yeah. play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What was your personal connection to these teams? Um, well, the 71 team was my, my first year in Babe Ruth. Um, 71 team was, uh, I was a first year player on, on 1971, so I was drafted. So I didn't get a chance to play much, but I had guys on my team like Pete Leinick, Joe Cataldo, um, Steve, uh, the oldest Steve Shaw, um, Paul McCumber mm -hmm. uh, played on my team, uh, the late Paul McCumber. And these guys um, sort of set the example for me and that summer when they went to the All-Stars, my grandparents would take me to all the games. They won the States up in uh, Lynn, Mass. And then they won, uh, they came within one game of winning the New England Regionals 
in Nashua. They lost to Puerto Rico, who was that. playing in New, New England. Yeah. Yep. Puerto Rico went on to win the World yeah. Series. I so Lemons, they got eliminated by the eventual World Series champion. Yeah. yeah. And that was your first year. Who did you play for? I played for uh, U-Trans, Donnie wow, Bigelow. I remember that. The and gold. then my second year, yeah. my second year, Bobby Koch was on the team, yeah. Louis Piano was on the team, Mike LeClaire, Mike wow. Gasparro. And uh, that 72 team was the host team. The, the state tournament was being held in Lemonster that year. The host team doesn't win anything. They're there because they have to be there to fill out the, the, the slate. Mm -hmm. They went on to win it. Again, losing to Puerto Rico and Newport. Uh, Puerto Rico went on to the World Series. My year in 73, we won the state championships in Longmeadow. We lost to Puerto Rico in Lynn, and uh, Puerto Rico didn't win the World Series that year. But uh, again, they always showed up. These guys played, you know, 10, 12 months a year. It's kind of tough to compete this with. This is them. bringing back a lot of memories because I used to follow those games. I can remember Puerto Rico playing at the, the Babe Ruth Field, mm -hmm. and that was just the, uh, the talk. The talk of the town was how yeah. good this team was, right. and Lemister was being competitive with them, which yeah. was kind of a great thing. Mm. All right, so we want to talk about where these books can be acquired. Do you want to start, if someone wanted to buy a copy of your book, where, where would they be? They can be get it on Amazon. It? You can okay. just um, do a, a search. Uh, the name of the book is A Place in Time, Youth, Community, and Baseball. And uh, that's a 15-year-old me on the cover there. I can't see it. Right. Oh, well, we it, sorry. <laughs> Let no me take chance. a look. And um, you wow. get on Amazon. Yep. Uh, it's also at uh, Barnes & Noble. You can order it there. Or you can go to my website, which is www.aplaceintimebook.com. Okay. And Mark? All right. Well, I have a website, too. And mine's very simple. It's just my name, markbodanza.com. Um, also, you can get it on Amazon. Just throw my name into the search uh, bar, and all of my books come up. And you can also get it at Barnes & Noble, which i, I got to say the local Barnes & Noble store has been very good to me over the years. And, um, and that's it. So this is book number, geez, I'm, I lose track. This is 12. Wow. Since 2009. Yeah. 2013's written. Uh, I mean, 13's written, but it won't probably be published until late next year. Okay. What is it? It's a biography of Johnny Appleseed. Johnny it'll be, it'll be published coincidentally with the 250th anniversary of his birth, which is in 2024. And the mayor and the committee that I'm on will be doing all sorts of things uh, in commemoration of that uh, event. And I, you know, the, actually the bookstore manager at Barnes & Noble talked me into writing the book. I said, well, I'm from Lummis, so it's sort of obligatory, you know. But it, the story is a lot more fascinating than I thought. Yeah, I heard some things. It's a I lot heard some more, things. It's a lot more fast. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a. He's a. He's. he's a, it's a guy. He's a. He lived a life like no other. Yeah. Yeah. So, What's number two? You got one. I got a couple of things in mind here. Yeah. Uh, I got a biography of a baseball giant in Lemonster. I'll just leave it at that. That okay. I got uh, kind of in swirling around in my head. I'm being encouraged by guys like Don Frieda, yeah. who also used to co coach uh, Lemonster yeah. High School and Legion baseball to to put this book together. Um, and then I also uh, intend to do a little bit more around the, this notion of community mm -hmm. and some of the challenges that we're seeing in communities today with addiction and depression and mental illness and how a lot of the things that we talked about from the 60s and 70s would go a long way to helping to alleviate. Yeah, I was just, that thought was going through my mind where, you know, that, that sense of community, neighborhood, working out problems um, would go a long way, yeah. like you said. Mm -hmm. These kids, are, uh, they're lacking yeah, in that. We're I mean, failing them. Yeah, um, we're lacking. Yeah. How do you, I know we're probably running over time, but I had to ask this. Like when you're sitting down and you're writing, um, what's it feel like? <laughs> I know, I know. It, for me, it's, it's just total relaxation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because I write exclusively, so far at least, nonfiction, the stuff that I find, I just need to share with somebody. I just don't want to keep it for myself. I just feel like I want other people to... I, I'm amazed by some of it, and yeah. I want other people to know about it. Then after the writing part's done, and I use a, a tablet and a pen. Yeah. After the writing part's done, the real fun starts. Yeah. The work starts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for me, it's... Um, first of all, I've got the bug. 
I've got the bug. I was thinking about my second book when I was halfway through my first. And I'm trying to balance. <laughs> That's how it goes. I still work, so I got to find the time. But uh, to Mark's point, it is. It's very, very relaxing. Um, it's also an opportunity for me to give back, especially the context of the the material that I'm writing about, because um, these three Babe Ruth teams, these guys were my heroes growing up, and they meant a lot to me. The guys that were older set an example. So this is their book as much as it is my book. And uh, I know I've heard it from a lot of families uh, of players who played there, um, remembering all the different things that the community did to bring it together. So writing for me is, um, is, is really uh, become a passion, and uh, it's something that I will continue yeah, to do. Based on the example that he keeps putting out there, I'm never going to catch up to 12 books. <laughs> well, but it's, not, I, it's not about that. No, no, but no, there, to yeah. your point, there's a lot of stories yeah. about our community yeah. that can be told. The, yeah. the, the ultimate reward, and you've probably already experienced this, and I remember early on when my first book, I had a young woman come up to me, and she said, you know, I want to thank you. I said, What's, what for? She said, um, my son read your book. I said, oh, that's nice. He goes, well, that's the first book he read. Wow. And she said, you know, he's now interested in reading books. And she said, it's the football theme that got him. And I said, well, if I can get people, especially young people, to read these books, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. That's the reward. Yeah, yeah. And, like, again, I, I relate things personally. Um, I, wow, what I like to write, but I kind of, like, got... When I was in high school, I couldn't spell. I still can't spell. Mm. Uh, I've got attention deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can sit down to read a book. I'm good for about 15 minutes, and then my brain goes somewhere else. But the zone, there's a zone that you can get in. And I think each individual that has some type of creativity has, a, has a, something that gets them in that zone. And I kind of find that like when I'm sitting down editing. Yeah. I used to find it mm -hmm. editing film. Now I find it, you know, at a computer, um, looking at the old film footage, even putting together the thing for the for the Hall of Fame, researching some of these old clips that go back to the 50s. You get in that zone, time does not exist. Right. Nothing else That's exists. the fun part. When you you're get into that there. situation where the piece parts are coming together and you're crafting your story mm -hmm. and it's kind of flowing, there are days when you don't want to even think about yeah. it. And you, it's, I know it's a cliche. You have to find a way to force yourself, even if it's for 10 minutes, to stay on it. Yeah. Because that'll keep you motivated to do something the next day and the next day until it starts to come together. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, it's a, it's a brick. It's like building a brick wall. Yeah. It's a brick at a One time. One at a time. Yeah, that's yeah. it. What can you relate that to? Brick wall, one brick at a time. Well, my father used to no, tell no, me. No, 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 no. Uh, let's get into the music thing. Oh, yeah. the music? Yeah. Uh, brick wall. Let's brick, get, oh, brick on the wall, yeah. Pink Floyd. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to jump on the wall. You gave me a high fastball. High fastball, like a whiff. I thought you I was, I was setting you up for that one. I thought uh, you were going to jump all over it. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> we got we got to cut this anyway. We must have went over by, what, 10 minutes anyway? You know? yeah. If I say anyway one more time, slug me. No, but you can anyway. edit it down to whatever you need. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah, it was great. We're going to yeah. do it again. It's yeah, I like conversation. Write another yeah. book. Hurry up. Let's go. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I get to ask permission. It's not, we're not on anymore, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to, I'm going to talk to Coach Johnson. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. still around. I, I, I talked with him, sent him a book. We yeah. talked throughout the book. He encouraged me, but... Yeah. I don't know if you'd have, uh, I could have read an unauthorized one, but I'd rather do it with his cooperation. Oh, you got to do it with his cooperation. I, I can't imagine he wouldn't. No. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. I set the table to do it. He, don't, don't forget the racehorses. I've written four. Right. Four. Oh, yeah. Why do you think he never coached on Sundays <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, for Legion? Uh, I've written four, four biographies, and, you know, one of, one of them, the lady was dead, so you no know, worries there. But the other were all with the cooperation. Yeah. And just the emotional element you can add. Yeah. One of the things one of my editors taught me early on with Jojo White's book was, you know, you got to get get the emotional quotes because it makes the book. Right. And he, he was the kind of guy that he was so... We, we, we can go out on this. I got one Emil Johnson story. Okay. Junior high school. We used to have the, the, at Gallagher, that fenced in area, and after lunch, you had to go out there, yeah. and Emil used to stand at the gate, and you had to watch it come He's in. He's the praying teacher. Out. Yeah, he used to stand there. And uh, I quit baseball. And I quit because I got involved with gymnastics yeah. and the swim team. And uh, so he comes up to me, and he goes, boy, come here. 
I heard you quit baseball, boy. And he says, yeah. And I explained, yeah, I get involved with this. And, you know, he goes, you're going to be a quitter, boy. You're going to go from job to job, school to school. You'll never settle down. <laughs> never forget it. He was right. <laughs> My first day of going to printing class. He was right. We had just won the Little League. Uh, we went to the States in Little League. And I remember in printing class in seventh grade, he had us fill out an index card. You know, what sports do you play? Because he's thinking ahead to soccer yeah. and baseball. Yeah. And so I told him I played baseball. I told him I threw right-handed. I batted left-handed. When he saw the card, he saw that. And he says, you bat left-handed? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, uh, you're going to play left field for me someday. Well, and that's exactly <laughs> what, what I did in my junior senior <laughs> year. Yeah, he was a kid. What a great way to step outside your book. Yeah. <laughs> right. With that anecdote. There, there you go. All right, guys, let's right. we're gonna wrap it up. Jack, say, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Great. We, Mark, we could sit yeah. here and just, so great. We, we could do a show just like reminiscing without the books. And just, <laughs> just talk lemons. But anyway, we gotta go. We've run over and uh, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, Happy, Happy Thanksgiving election. Day. Get out there and vote.